Our final company, we hear from AIM listed Petromatad, the Mongolian oil developer and explorer whose flagship development is the head in one oil field in eastern Mongolia. Uh, future production there and development elsewhere in Mongolia is what they're about. Head in one contains 100 to 200 million barrels of recoverable oil in block 20 in the far eastern part of the country near the Chinese border. And Petromatad holds two production shooting contracts with the Mongolian government. The project has been slowed by Chinese COVID restrictions and land access issues. And CEO Mike Buck is here to tell us the latest as Mongolia, Mongolia heads into the winter months. Welcome, Mike. Welcome, Mike. How are you? Thank, thank you, Donald. I'm very well. How about yourself? Well, I'm having a terrific evening. I, I, I spend a month or so putting these events together. And then there's this glorious moment when you actually get to speak to CEOs and they tell you all about their interesting companies. And I have to say, I, have, I thoroughly enjoy these evenings. And I, I've, we've had you on many times, so I know I thoroughly enjoy speaking to you. So over to you. You tell us the, the, the latest on Petromatad. OK, well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to give an operational update, as this slide says. Um, but first of all, for those that are on the, uh, on the webinar that have never heard of us, I'll give a, uh, just a little flavor of the background as we go through. I won't read out the disclaimer. Uh, we have a board of directors. I'm the chief executive. We've got a couple of uh, Mongolian ladies on the board from our uh, founding shareholder. Uh, and uh, Tim Bushell, who is well known in the, in the, the London oil industry. Um, quite a lot of experience on this board and uh, also a lot of enthusiasm. In summary, then, Petromatad is uh, AIM listed um, and has always been Mongolian focused uh, upstream exploration and production company. And we claim to be Mongolia's most active explorer. We currently have two areas that I'll shortly show you on a map. Uh, we made two discoveries in the east of the country in 2019, and I'm going to talk about one of those in some detail, Heron number one, um, which flowed at um, 821 barrels a day on test, the third best test rate ever recorded in Mongolia. Um, we have achieved um, the success of getting our exploitation license. That was last year. Seems a little longer ago than that, but it was only last year. And we've been granted that license over a a pretty large and prospective piece of, of acreage. Um, we had planned to start production in 2022. A few things have got in the way, but primarily uh, we have a little bit of a, a land uh, access issue due to, due to some inconsistencies in Mongolian land law. And although that's a little bit of a dry subject, I know some of our shareholders um, are frustrated and tearing their hair out, as am I. Uh, so I'll go into a little bit more detail than land issues would normally, I think, um, um, uh, generate and, re and require. We are no, now, though, making some progress, and I'll talk about that. And we also have some high impact uh, exploration to talk about and a new licensing round that has just been announced by, um, by Mongolia. <clears throat> So just to locate everybody, here is a, a map, an outline map showing the country of Mongolia, two and a half times the size of France and three million population of which 50% live in capital. Um, we have over in the east, a tiny little red blob there is our block 20 exploitation license, 218 square kilometers, immediately to the south of the two main producing areas in, uh, in Mongolia. Um, and then over in the central part of the country, uh, two little pink areas shown there are what we hold of block five. And that is where we have some frontier exploration uh, potential. The western part of Mongolia is very, very lightly explored for oil. Uh, but as I'll show you on a map of the new exploration licensing round, uh, there are many attractive basins and one thing Mongolia has going for it, for the geologists amongst you, it has fantastic surface outcrop. So the, it's a field geologist's um, um, paradise. And just briefly on the Mongolian oil industry, the chart at the top shows Mongolia's historic oil production peaking in 2015 at about 25,000 barrels a day. So Mongolia is, has never been a huge producer of oil, but it certainly has the aspiration to increase that and is now trying to encourage investors to come in from the international community and help do that by um, revitalizing exploration efforts. Um, part of their uh, 
reasoning here and why the government is so keen on this is that at the moment, all of that oil that's produced in uh, Mongolia is trucked into China. And then Mongolia is left to buy its product needs from Russia. And the refined product need is around about 40,000 barrels a day. So Mongolia is currently building a, um, a domestic refinery that's going to take 30,000 barrels a day of feedstock. And obviously 30,000 barrels a day is more than the country is currently producing. So they're very keen to get some more fields on production. And uh, the heron discovery that we made in 2019 was a very, very uh, timely discovery indeed, uh, because once the refinery is on stream, currently estimated to be sometime around about 2025, and then the government is certainly keen for Heron One to be um, up the production curve and filling the gap that uh, is currently between the country's total production and the capacity throughput of the refinery. So let's home in on that acreage in the east. Um, on the map, I'm showing our exploitation license area highlighted in white. And all of those green blobs are oil discoveries. You can see a number of them in uh, block 19 to immediately to the north. We're only 15 or 17 kilometers away from uh, PetroChina's processing facilities there in block 19, uh, from which they process their oil and then they truck it uh, down south in this case through our block into, uh, into China. As I said, Heron 1 I gave good test results um, on, on DST, 45 degree API produ oil producer surface. We've had a competent persons report done that uh, kind of confirmed our own numbers for oil in place potential in, in um, Heron of just short of 200 million barrels in place. And that translates to um, between 33 and 60 million barrels depending on the recovery factor you use. This is very low cost appraisal and development. Wells here cost of the order of 1.5 to $2 million to drill, depending on depth. And the Chinese contractors in this area are quite keen to work on a lump sum basis in which they take some of the risk. Uh, so basically they, they will be contracted to drill your well to a certain depth uh, for that amount of money. And if they don't get there, they'll try again for the same money. You don't have to keep paying them. Now, the land issue that I mentioned has been causing us problems is basically since we were granted our exploitation uh, license. And even before that, the inconsistencies in the land law had caused some friction between central government and local government. And the local government in this area has been the host to the vast majority of Mongolia's production over the years. And it's fair to say that some of the local communities don't feel that they got a lot out of that uh, production activity. And to some extent, Petromatad has been tarred with the same brush. We've done quite a lot of community work in the communities that surround our area. We have good relationship with the locals. But when it comes to central government trying to get local government to support their projects, there's still a little bit of work to be done. And in 2017, some new regulations and legislation was brought in uh, that complicated matters still further. What we really need here is something called special purpose certification. And block 19 to the north has special purpose certification granted in 2012. We've been trying to get it since 2019, since we made our discovery. And this legislation in 2017 has rather complicated that in that there is now a process to go through uh, that is a bit long winded and has many, many steps. Anyway, cabinet, uh, the cabinet of the Mongolian government uh, finally pushed for this process to be started for our acreage this year. And so the authorities are following that process right now. There were some meetings in um, August and September in the local area as expected or as we expected anyway the the local uh, committees said they didn't actually support this certification they didn't want it to happen and so it was sent back to central government with a no we don't support now they don't have a veto um, but i think central government well i know central government hasn't faced this problem before because well anyway this legislation is quite new um, we were invited back down to the, uh, to the, to the field to present to the committees uh, shortly after they had voted not to support. They told us they expect to be ignored by central government. They said that's the way it usually works. But they all also told us that if we continue to operate as we always have, fully in line with the law, 
and do um, things that bring socioeconomic benefit to the uh, communities in which we operate, then they will have no reason to stand in our way. So that was very uh, comforting that despite this friction uh, between local and central government, the reaction to Petra Matad as a company is pretty good. What we're doing right now on the land issue is we're lobbying the, the ministries that are involved, and that's the Ministry of Mining that controls what, uh, what we do, and the Ministry of Construction and Urban Development that is responsible for um, the land law and the land agency. We're lobbying them to present to cabinet as soon as possible to secure this certification. Um, when we met with the Minister of Mining, the new Minister of Mining, uh, in October, he said that um, he, like everybody else in central government, now completely understands our problem and uh, they are going to fix it. He said he was going to fix it within one to three months. Um, that was that was good news. Uh, I was impolite enough to point out how many months we'd already been waiting, but he took that in good part uh, and understood that um, there is an urgency there. So we are actually seeing some some progress in this. One of the other uh, delays we faced is China's reaction to uh, COVID. Fair enough in 2020 and 2021, but I, I'm not sure anybody expected that 2022 would have, would have been as bad as it has been for China. And why that impacts us is that most of the services that are provided to the Mongolian oil sector come from Chinese contractors who are headquartered in China. And so the issues and impacts of that have been um, quite strongly felt. It's now improving. It's been improving since um, China stopped locking down its population. Um, so for the last few months, the border has been easier to get stuff across and things have definitely improved. And we're hoping that those issues are behind us because we have been making preparations for production, even though we have this land issue. Some of these, uh, some of the equipment we need is uh, relatively long lead time items made even more long lead by the fact that they've got to come across a border that was shut on the Chinese side for quite a long time, whilst on the Mo Mongolian side, things have been open throughout. So anyway, in the time that, uh, or during 2022, where we've been fighting this land issue, we've procured um, um, through tendering, ordering, manufacture and shipping, all of the items we now need to put the Heron One well on stream just as soon as this uh, uh, legal issue is sorted out. The frac program for the well has been designed with expert input. Um, the, the local Chinese fracking company has some very good equipment and some very good skills. We'd like to bring uh, to that some international uh, expertise and that is why we've uh, designed our frac using uh, using um, that in international expertise. The contracts are in place to do that. We've also got contracts in place for the completion of the well, the testing necessary, and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, um, uh, frac service provider to actually do the work. And that's a relatively short piece of work. So as soon as we can get back on the well site, we'll be doing that. Um, our 2019 contract for drilling is actually still valid with DQE Drilling, who are the major supplier of um, drilling services in Mongolia. We, as I say, we have a, a contract that's still valid for one more well. Uh, but what we've been doing is we've been in negotiation with DQE for quite some time now, and we're at an advanced stage for a multi-well, multi-year drilling contract, which incorporates some significant cost reductions compared to what we achieved in, in 2019 also with some payment deferral. And, and that's a nice thing to have um, in that that allows us to get the drilling contract moving and pay for a portion of the well costs out of production from the wells that we drill. Um, we are negotiating with, with DQE to try and finalize that. Once it's ready, we will go for regulatory approval. Um, and we're hoping that uh, our regulator, which is uh, uh, MR PAM, uh, will approve that. At the moment, DQE Drilling is the only company in Mongolia that has well uh, rigs that can drill to the well depths that we need. Um, so we're expecting that, uh, that that will go ahead, but we're looking forward to getting that moving because it gives us the potential to accelerate the development and all, therefore accelerate revenue generation and to increase value because the major component of the um, development cost on, uh, on Heron is drilling related. 
there's not much needed in the way of uh, facilities. And we have nearby facilities with, uh, in, in PetroChina's block. And we have a memorandum of understanding with PetroChina to use those. So um, block 20 um, exploitation license, we're pushing very hard to get this land issue sorted out. Meanwhile, we're negotiating this contract with DQE and we're looking forward to getting this started as soon as possible. We're now entering the winter hiatus in, in Mongolia, um, although we do understand that PetroChina, having had a large backlog of work that it needs to do that resulted from the COVID shutdowns, is keeping some of the contracting companies running longer than they usually do. Uh, if we can sort out the land issue quickly, then we would try and use whoever's in country to do our fracking and testing and to get to Heron 1 ready for production. Production operations run year round, but uh, drilling operations and the associated services usually do not. Uh, we'll see once that, uh, once that issue is sorted out, who's in country and whether we can uh, move quickly. Otherwise, it will wait for people to come back from their, uh, from their, their, their winter holidays back in, in China uh, sometime in late March or, or early April. So that's the situation on, um, on Block 20 in the east. And as I mentioned, in the central part of Mongolia, we have Block 5. We haven't said much about this uh, recently, um, but I think one of the big pieces of news here is that we don't have a land issue here because the local authorities here are prepared to grant the kind of permits that um, the local authorities in the east have been withholding from various operators due to the historical um, um, fights they've had with other operators and, and with the central government. So block five, we drilled a well in 2018 called Snow Leopard number one. It was not a commercial discovery, but it had very good oil shows, basically proved that this area has a working petroleum system. And um, we have identified a series of um, structures immediately to the south of Snow Leopard number one in the same basin uh, that we have now high graded and got ready for drilling. This is what we call our Raptor trend. And we have also just received approval from the Ministry of Mining to extend a moratorium we held in 2021, which was due to COVID delays. We've extended it through 2022. Uh, so we have basically extended the expiration period until the middle of 2024. So that gives us time to drill this well in 2023. And in the happy event of success, be uh, enable us to have time to acquire all the data we will need to get the exploitation license for this area. Now, this is transformational potential. Um, the, the, the prospect that we're target, targeting is called Velociraptor, 200 million barrels of recoverable resource potential, and it's drill ready. In structures on either side, it has 380 million barrels of follow-up potential. The drilling cost here is, $1.7 million. So compare that to the cost of a deep water well uh, offshore, uh, offshore Africa, for example. And this is very, very high impact exploration at a very, very low cost. We're giving ourselves here about a 20% chance of success. That's better than most um, high impact frontier wells have. And the reason it's better is because with Snow Leopard 1, we prove that this basin is actually currently producing hydrocarbons. We just need to find a structure in which those hydrocarbons have migrated. And we think the Raptor trend offers us that, uh, that, that possibility. We have, uh, with our Block 20 exploitation license being granted last year, the precedent is set to retain more than just the discovery area. Um, uh, we, in Block 20, re we retained the surrounding exploration upside and we would hope to do the same in the event of success at Velociraptor. And that's of interest to the government as well, because um, if we get going with this, then Velociraptor could be ready to be on the stream um, by the time that the Mongol refinery needs it. So um, uh, I think that's in, in part why the government was as enthusiastic as they were to give us that extra time to make sure that we could uh, get this done. So potential to be on, on, on stream within two years. And um, we have in the prospect itself, we have stacked reservoir targets all with enclosure below the mid Cretaceous un unconformity. So once we reach the depth of about 600 meters, we're actually inside the prospect from there all the way to, to the final depth. 
The total depth we're, we're, we're planning to reach is uh, 1,500 meters. And so that gives us 900 meters of stacked um, potential within, within the prospect to investigate with the well. As I said, well cost around about $1.7 million. We have selected a contractor um, that has been approved by the regulator. The equipment is in country. And as I said at the start, most importantly, permits are in place. We have the land permit, we have water use permits, we have all the permits we need. This is huge resource potential, 100% in the hands of uh, Petro Matad. The fiscal, uh, the fiscal terms in Mongolia are our top quartile. So a discovery here would, as I said, be transformational, not just for us, but actually for Mongolia. And as I said, wildcat exploration, at a, at a better than wildcat chance of success, 20% versus what you would normally say would be less than 10% uh, for, a, uh, for, a, for a frontier well. Now, um, MR Palm has just announced, actually they announced on the 30th of November and they made a presentation on the 2nd of December in Singapore at the Asia Pacific Scout Check of their 2022-23 uh, licensing round. They are offering 14 uh, blocks for PSC. They're shown on this map in blue. And the first tranche of these is available now. The first tranche is five blocks, which have um, a, a red highlighter to them. And you can see them located there in the uh, central southern part of the, of the country. Um, Petro Matad has a significant competitive advantage here. Obviously, we've got many years of experience in country, but we have a comprehensive database, which I think is the rival of, uh, of uh, well, everybody should be jealous of it. Uh, in the early days of uh, Petro Matad, a large amount of field work was done, not only in basins that we were operating in, but in, in many of the other basins. So as I say, our, our database is, is second to none. We've already identified the areas that are of interest to us, and we are very, very well placed to move forward with this. Um, with um, the block 20 exploitation license now being only a couple of hundred square kilometers, but we have that acreage for 25 years plus. Um, and with block five expiring in, in July 24, now is the time to restock the portfolio. And we're very much looking forward to participating here. Uh, we can do this at a 100% working interest, or we can find like-minded individuals to share the cost and the risk. So partnering for us in this would be something we would be very interested in. And we'll be advertising ourselves as a potential operator of choice for the, for the licensing round. So in summary then, um, the Block 20 land issue is progressing slowly, uh, slower than we would obviously have liked. But I think it's fair to say now that government is fully engaged and this process under the 27 legislation is now moving forward. And what we need to see is the central government um, take the reins here and basically say, OK, thank you, local government. You've had your say. We're going to we're going to certify this land because we need this work to be done, because this needs to help fill up the Mongol refinery. And I'm, I'm optimistic that that is going to happen and is going to happen relatively quickly. We are ready in the meantime for production startup and development once that uh, land issue is sorted. And we're looking forward to getting that started as early in the new year as possible. The high impact Velociraptor well is permitted. Contracting is ongoing, largely complete. And uh, the, as I said, the potential there is, is transformational. The licensing round has started and we look to exploit our significant competitive advantage. And another thing that we're progressing uh, that I haven't really had the chance to talk about tonight um, but we will be talking again um, pretty, pretty soon, I hope, is we're progressing the possibility to get involved in the renewable energy sector in Mongolia. We've identified a, a would-be partner in this that has experience and has very, very good contacts in the Ministry of Energy. And we think their expertise and ours would make for a, a very strong um, uh, uh, joint venture to pursue renewables. And that's a string of the, uh, a, a, a new string to the bow that we would like to exploit as quickly as possible. And with that, uh, Donald, I think, uh, I think I've finished.
Okay, fantastic, man. That's absolutely brilliant as ever. Let me just quickly uh, name check a few people who've asked a sort of timeline question about uh, the land issue. Michael Bowman, Richard Poole, Terry Goldsmith, um, pretty much all the questions that we've had in uh, reference the, the the land issue. You said you said relatively quickly. Um, yeah. Try and unpack relatively quickly for us. Um, yeah. You also said that the, the the Chinese might come back from their their holidays March April. Is that a realistic time frame? That March April the licensing, you know, the, the special license special purpose certification might have been sorted out. Uh, I I I think so. Um... Certainly, I was heartened to hear the new minister uh, in the first meeting we had with him back in October say that he was fully aware of what the problems were. And clearly talking to him and, and his and his team, they were. Um, and he was going to fix it within one to three months, were, were, were his exact words. And that was in October. Uh, so we're, we're a way through that. But where the delay in this came was we were pushing for a very long time for this process under the 2017 legislation to start. And the government, central government was of the view that, well, no, we don't need to do that. We'll just get local government approvals as we have tended to do in the past. Our impression was that whilst that might work in somewhere like block five, where it has, over in block 20 and in the doorknob area, it wasn't working so well. So I am now um, optimistic and very, very hopeful that we will get central government to say, okay, under these terms of the land law, uh, we are going to certify this area and that will allow us to get back on site. Um, the, uh, the, the, the contractors usually come back from their, their, their winter hiatus in, in March, April. There's the possibility that some of them will be staying through the winter because they're working on catching up on, on, on PetroChina work. So we'll certainly be phoning them up the moment we get uh, a, a land issue sorted out to say, hey, guys, where are you? Have you got the kit? Have you got the people? Let's get on with it. Fantastic. Uh, and, and the China COVID lockdown, um, is that still actually causing you problems? Or have you got all the kit in that you need? Uh, ahead of yeah, I mean, for block five, we've got all the kit in except one or two widgets, um, but they're relatively small and, and, and not exactly critical path at the moment. I think they'll be in very soon. Uh, on block 20, it took us a long time to get some stuff across the border um, and, and even for some of it to leave the, uh, the factories in which it was manufactured. Unfortunately, the, the city of Daiching, which is the home of DQE Drilling, the, uh, the company that um, provides all these services, that was in lockdown through most of September and October on a citywide lockdown. So you can understand why things weren't moving. They've moved now though. Uh, the Mongolian side of the, the border with China has been open throughout. Uh, the Chinese side is the one that's been shut down. And obviously a large amount of, um, of material to be transported across the border was accumulating on the Chinese side and it was coming across very, very slowly. It does now seem to be improving. Um, and with what's happening in China generally, we're, we're, we're pretty hopeful that we won't need to be talking about COVID-19 impacts on our work anymore. Uh, John Smith asks about the Velo Velociraptor uh, drill. It's ready to go, then with permits and equipment in place. Um, when can we expect the drill bit hitting the ground? Yeah, well, the, the contractor for this um, uh, has quite a lot of work for the rig that we're going to use. Um, but he's indicated to us that in the time frame of sometime in the middle of the first quarter um, of next year, uh, the rig should be available. And this is a rig that is winterized. It can work throughout. It has done in the past in Mongolia. It costs a little bit more because you need more diesel to heat stuff up. Uh, but um, but it, it is winterized and, and, and available. So we're looking at a second half of the first quarter or into the second quarter um, to drill that well. Um, yeah, we don't. Th there's no there's no permitting standing in the way, and there's no equipment issues that stand in the way either. The Contractor is actually planning to import a bigger rig from uh, South America, we believe. And he's actually told us that if it arrives in time, we can have that for the same cost of the smaller rig that we are planning to use. We're happy with either, um, but you know, my experience has been, 
uh, if you've got a bit more uh, if you've got a bit more horsepower available, then you should probably take it. But we'll see what their what their timing is. We're not going to wait for a, a, another rig when the one that's there is perfectly serviceable and perfectly usable and is working now. Okay, and um, has it been an expensive time for you? You've, you've got Velociraptor on the go, you've got Head and One on the go, and you've got all the kit in place, more or less. Um, you know, what are, what are you what are your bank balance? What's your what's your funding looking like at the moment? Okay, well, we raised um, ten million dollars in twenty twenty one in the in the hope of being able to start because of all the promises that had been made about the land issue being fixed so quickly. Obviously, that didn't happen, but we haven't sat on our hands for the year. As I say, we've we've bought equipment. We're around about uh, six million bucks in the bank now. Um, you know, we've been reasonably frugal with it on, on overhead. We certainly haven't recruited anybody new. Um, we've we've been running with the, the same team we've had throughout. We intend to continue with that as we enter into the development. Um, so we've got um, plenty of money left for the completion of Heron and some more drilling, depending on what we finally come up with on terms and conditions for the DQE drilling contract. And uh, yeah, we have money available to drill uh, uh, Velociraptor 1, and we'd like to get started on, on renewables. Right. So at the moment, the cash position is reasonably good. It might be a useful point to ask this question. You've you know, over the 20 minutes or so, you've given us a comprehensive overview of your drilling plans and timelines. Could you just remind our audience what the recovery factors and the peak production rates you're looking at at Heron? And I was yeah, I think yeah. That's why Heron is such a still still such a good thing? Yes, yeah. We, we mustn't forget that the asset no, is it there. Hasn't changed. Yeah, it is. It is there. Um, it, it, it comes down to you know we 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 I think. Generally, we've got an agreement, as I said, we had a competent person's report done. Well, obviously, we paid for that, but they insist that they will only put their own opinion in it. And they said 200 million barrels in place, which was around about the same number we had, or 194. Um, now, obviously, the recovery factor then determines how much of that you're going to get out. Um, and the basin, this basin has a lot of wells drilled in it um, by PetroChina. They haven't applied some technologies that we would have expected them to have applied, like a lot of horizontal drilling once they know where the sweet spots in the reservoir are. Um, fracks that are a little more than just rudimentary. I don't want to be rude, but they seem to do the same frack for every well, kind of irrespective of what the reservoir looks like. Um, and some other technologies like radial drilling or, or, or fishbone completions that actually inc increase reservoir contact. So. PetroChina's recovery factors so far are, are what, what you would say low compared to what they achieve in their fields in China, where some of the reservoirs are, are similar, and what generally is achieved uh, internationally. You know, if you're not achieving 30% recovery factor these days, then you're not doing it properly, would be most people's, um, most people's view. So What's we've done... 200 barrels? I'm sorry, Donald? 30% of 200 barrels? Yeah, so, so we're aiming for, I'd like to think a minimum of 30% recovery factor when we, when, once we've got a full spread of um, pressure support through water injection or CO2 injection or whatever we, we choose to use. Um, so if it was a 15% recovery factor, then it'd be around about 33 million barrels. I'm aiming for a 30% recovery factor and that will get us 60 million barrels. And uh, with the um, fiscal terms being as good as they are, that translates into a, a pretty valuable asset. Mike Buck, uh, see you at Petra Matad. We're out of time. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. That was terrific. Uh, it's been a tough year. Let's hope that 2023 is your year. Let's hope so. Thank you very much indeed.